Alright, you know, I can understand when gamers talk about how open world style of gameplay can get tiring and stale, but honestly, I believe no matter what design choice you go with, open world and open level design can give you a lot of creativity if you know what you're doing. Because what an open world game is trying to do is give you a sense of adventure. It's how it goes. For like, I'd say the first 10 to 15 hours, you're still getting your bearings of the map because maybe you keep getting lost and distracted because in your mind, you want to follow the main quest. But on the way to the main quest, you will run into like 10, possibly 100 different distractions before you even get to the first part of the first main quest. It's open world RPG 101. Give the player a sense of direction and lead them to a certain point only for them to get distracted by something that you placed on the side of the road because it's just too cool to ignore. It helps give the world an illusion that it's a real place with life brimming around every corner. Yeah, sure, maybe some NPCs spew the same dialogue over and over again like a broken record, and maybe you're gonna run into the same random encounter four to five times over, but they do their job at giving their respective game worlds the feeling of being alive. Because while you explore these open world games, you're gonna run into some funny encounters. Maybe you're playing Skyrim, and while horseback riding, you stumble upon a guy named Bulbas, and he gives you a fork that's used for something. I don't know, I only played like five hours of Skyrim before dropping it. I mean, you also got dragons. Or you're playing Red Dead 2, and as you're going through Valentine, you come across a random bar fight. Or you go and kill the KKK. Or maybe you're playing Cyberpunk 2077, and while walking around Night City, some random NPC just falls from the sky. Seriously, is this a glitch? I still don't know. And then, you got games like Dragon's Dogma 2, where one moment you're just walking around, and then a fucking griffin comes out of nowhere, and while you're fighting it, you hop on its back, and then you take a joyride across the map and knock it to the ground and get jumped by goblins and then die because you were underleveled, but you can't stop thinking about how fun that was, and then you realize that was quite possibly one of the greatest combat encounters you will ever have in a video game. And then you go right back to doing some of the most boring quest lines imaginable. Might I ask for your cooperation? This is Dragon's Dogma 2. An open world RPG with a primary focus on combat and exploration. And even though the exploration can get really tiring at times and the combat gets bland in the end game because you're way too over leveled for its enemies, its shortcomings don't take away from the fact that this is one of the most unique RPGs ever made. From the crazy mind of Hideaki Itsuno, the man who brought Devil May Cry back to life back in 2005, decided one day with his newfound power at Capcom to create a brand new RPG. RPG that he's been wanting to make ever since he was a child. With a focus on exploration and combat, he went on to make Dragon's Dogma 1, and then 12 years later comes back out with a proper sequel, which is also a reboot and a remake, but I'll explain that later. This game is special because unlike games like Skyrim and The Witcher where the focus isn't on combat but the story and choices of your actions, Dragon's Dogma goes almost the exact opposite and puts focus on the journey getting to your destination only for you to be disappointed because your reward for the quest kinda sucks ass, but the combat is dope and the bosses are cool so you have fun running around into these combat scenarios along the way so it keeps it from getting stale. The optimization is terrible, the fast travel system is interesting but half-baked, the NPCs are all lifeless, the story is almost non-existent, it feels to unfinished at many points in the game. Side quests are either really cool or really shit, and almost everything about what makes this game good falls off in the final section of the game. To put it frankly, this game confuses me, pisses me off at times, and yet I put over 100 hours into it because it's some of the most fun I've ever had walking around in an RPG. Please help me, I can't stop playing it. I think I'm addicted to Dragon's Dogma 2. <laughs> Alright, so I know nothing about the first Dragon's Dogma, but I know Itsuno is a fucking baller when it comes to making video games. Besides Devil May Cry 2, which Itsuno didn't even work on until halfway through development, him and his team know how to make video games fun. Devil May Cry is unironically one of my favorite video game franchises ever made. I love the fifth game so much, and seeing how Dragon's Dogma has a dedicated cult following and it was created by the man here, I'm surprised I didn't hear about this franchise sooner. It wasn't until the sequel was announced that I actually noticed the game's existence for once and I decided, hey, you know what? what, I might as well give the sequel a try when it comes out. And before playing the game, I didn't even know what to expect. And when I actually got down to playing it when it came out, I was both pleasantly surprised and also kind of pissed off because the optimization was bad. And even though this game spent most of the time stealing my lunch money and then shoving my face into the sand, I had the time of my life playing this game. It's not perfect by any means, but what this game has clearly easily can be fine-tuned, and if they put more focus on quest and enemy design, then we got ourselves a perfect game here. I mean, to put it frankly, Dragon's Dogma 2 might be the most solid 7 to 7.5 game I've ever played in my life. Which I think is what people were saying about the first game. So, like, is this game right here even a sequel, technically? Nah, eh, whatever, it was still fun. Anyways, Let's start this review. Can I even classify this as a review? I don't know, don't rat on me. So the game begins with a cutscene inside of a dinner hall with a POV shot of a certain character that'll be shown later in the game. Who 
Please. Un video más para anunciarle que Dude sits down, dude hears voices, and then it cuts to black. You do a hard cut to a jail cell, and then you go to make your fella. I named my guy Borkus. Uh, I tried to make it look like me, but he does not look like me whatsoever. He looks way cooler than me, but you know what? This is who I imagine I would look like in an RPG. I also made this other character named Putrid Gale. We don't talk about putrid Gale. You do some tutorial stuff in a slave camp, like learning how to grab stuff. You then grab your weapons, fight a Medusa, jump off a cliff, grab onto a griffin, and then you get to the title screen. Not sure why it's showing Dragon's Dogma and not Dragon's Dogma 2, but you know, that, uh, I guess we'll figure that out later. Bird gets shot down, you meet some white guys, and then you go to make your pawn. I named my guy Marcus. I don't know, I didn't feel like making a funny character, so I just named him Marcus. This is the story of Borcus and Marcus. And Brant's here too. And with the power of friendship, you are sent on a quest to fight through this dying world, take your place on the throne, and bring peace to the land itself. And not only that, you find out that your heart was actually taken by this giant dragon. And when that dragon took your heart, you became an immortal called the Arisen, and with the help of your pawns, you go to find that dragon and take back your heart. So with a grand goal in mind all set in motion, what does the game have you do to generate that friction? Lots of walking and shitty chores. Fuck you. Have fun. Go fall off a cliff. And you know what? Here's a pawn infected with dragon DNA. Fuck you. Go die. Yeah, this game kind of has a pretty meaty tutorial, and even after the first two hours, you're still learning shit after every turn. Even up until the end of the game. Anyways, after you talk to the brand dude who literally has one set of motion throughout the entire story, the game can officially start. So how does exploration work in this game? Like for example, in most open world games, to travel, you got things like cars, horseback riding, flying, horseback riding, hang gliding, horseback riding. I mean, there's a lot of ways to travel in open world video games. It's how most games that are open world RPGs work, like you need a ride that you can travel on to help you with your adventure so you can go out and find places. I mean, it's not like a game studio would develop this big ass open world game and the only way for you to travel around it is by walking. I mean, that would be ridiculous. Welcome to Dragon's Dogma 2. Oh, and Death Stranding. To an extent. Yeah, Dragon's Dogma 2 makes you walk everywhere. I mean, you got ox carts that take you to like the four major points in the map, but between those four major points, you have to basically walk everywhere if you want to find what you're looking for. And even then, ox carts aren't free of problems either. There's usually a 50-50 chance when riding an ox cart that it gets ambushed, and now you have to worry about the cart getting destroyed because it can happen in this game, so watch where you're fighting and- Oh, it's gone. Have fun walking now, you fat fuck. Oh, and you probably also don't have a camp site available to help raise your health. So, uh, good luck! And yes, in games like Fallout, your main way of getting around and finding new locations is by walking and exploring off the main path. But in those games, you didn't have to backtrack to go back to a previous location. You could just open up your Pip-Boy and just teleport to wherever you like. And you may be asking, but Mason, I heard Dragon's Dogma does have fast travel as well. Doesn't that make it easier in the game? It does, yes, but the fast travel is limited as fuck in this game because, I mean, there's only two major port crystals in, like, two of the major cities. And one of those major cities is a fucking fishing village. <laughs> There's not even a crystal in Back Batal, which is really fucking crazy considering there's so much important stuff to do in that city. So the only way to fast travel to places like these is to place down your own personal port crystal that you find throughout the world, but those are limited as well and you can only place down like 12 or 13 at a time. So the game pretty much encourages you to walk everywhere. Dragon's Dogma might honestly be the first strand type game to go all the way with it. Like in Death Stranding, you got this online system where people build roads so you can have an easier way of getting to the major cities. I mean, I know it's not fast travel, but it's easier than walking. But also, I don't think it's a bad system to place your own personal fast travel locations. I think it's just annoying how it's limited to only like a couple of spots. It's just a very interesting mechanic. And when it comes to exploring is that that's what's honestly the most fun part about this game. This game was designed around you with your party going along these set trails and finding what perks your interest in between. Whether if it's an ogre boss fight or a new cave you haven't explored. Even if the awards are shit and it's the same ogre you fought like 20 times already, it's still a really fun experience either way. Because most of the time the combat encounters do differentiate from one another. And speaking of, let's talk about Dragon's Dogma's two best feature. The combat. Get the fuck down! Okay, so combat. We got eight different weapon types and nine different weapon classes in total. Weapon classes being called vocations here, and I don't even know what vocation actually stands for, but you know what, that's besides the point. 
So each one has their own set of move sets and play styles, and you can switch them out whenever you like, but mainly if you're inside of a big town is when you can switch out your vocation. So unless you want to play with a bow and arrow and a great sword, you're gonna want to stay close to the town so you can easily switch them out. Unless you got the warfare vocation equipped, and then at that point you can just use every weapon at once. My favorite vocations though being Thief, Mystic Spearhand, and the Magic Archer, but I don't use the Magic Archer that much because once you get past level 50, the game basically becomes a joke with it. I mean, the game does become a joke in general when it comes to the combat after level 50 because the enemies don't scale with you, so you're just overpowered as fuck. Granted, this is just how Magic Archer plays before level 50, if we're being honest. I tried using Mage and Sorcerer, and I saw gameplay with them. They aren't bad looking, but Mage is more of a supportive class, and Sorcerer looks cool, but I always liked getting up close and personal with an enemy more. And this game allows you to do that with ease. And this game's combat in particular almost like begs you to get up and close with the enemy. Because in this game, you can grab onto the big enemies and just stab the shit out of them in their weak points. You can climb on them, go for the weak points, and then once they're down, you can just stab them to death. This game basically is tailoring to the Shadow of the Colossus fans, and I can tell you one thing, it definitely is doing a good job. Or maybe it's not, I don't know, I never played it. Seriously though, this game makes me wish Elden Ring had this type of combat, because imagine if you were able to climb on dragons like Placid Dusex. It is the main selling point of Dragon's Dogma, but what sucks is that while the combat is fun, it does get kind of stale by the later end of the game. Being over level 50 and maxed out vocations will basically melt any enemy in your path. It's still fun, but man, the game needs a hard mode bad. New Game Plus as well is the same difficulty, so it's even easier than before because you're just blasting through all the lower level enemies that you met in the earlier game. Again though, this is actually some of the best combat I've ever played with in an RPG, so I really do hope a lot of other games take note of what Dragon's Dogma does with its combat because it's really impressive. But as I said earlier, the combat does get pretty stale due to how over leveled you can get, but that's also because the nemesis you fight just don't actually scale with you. I mean, it shows you getting stronger, but a lot of the major enemies that you fight just stay the exact same in terms of combat style and health. Like, the enemies in Dragon's Dogma 2 are an interesting bunch because there's a lot that I like about it when it comes to the enemies and combat encounters, but it's a mixed bag when it comes to the oversight of, like, the lack of enemy variety, enemy movesets, and just enemy style, basically. Like, the dragons you fight don't change throughout the entire game. Like, they're really cool when you first meet them, but they kind of just stay stagnant, and every time you run into them, they just get, you know, a little less cool as you come across them. I mean, they're still cooler than the rock lizards. I fucking hate the rock lizards. Worst enemy in the game. Also, you're gonna run into a lot of enemies on your travels. Like, a lot of enemies. Like, a lot, a lot. Like, so fucking many, I swear to god, it actually gets annoying. Like, at one moment, you're fighting a group of lizards, and you think, Oh, okay, that's the end of it. And then, a group of dogs just come out of nowhere and start attacking your entire crew, and you think, Oh, okay, well, I've now dwindled down the lizards, and I only have to fight the dogs now. But now you got a group of bandits and hobgoblins on your ass, like, it's just a whole fucking mess. Oh, and harpies. Can't forget about the harpies. I love it when they just grab your pawns, or grab you, and just throw you off the side of a mountain. It's so much fun. It's easier to fight the bosses than it is to fight a group of harpies. So on one hand, the combat is exhilarating and can be incredibly cinematic, with you being able to climb on the enemy's backs and just go to town on their weak points like Monster Hunter, but then the combat can get stagnant, or it could just get completely obnoxious. Or both. So then it just makes the game just not fun at times. <laughs> The three enemies I still mainly have fun fighting in this game, even at a high level, are the dragons, the griffins, and the chimeras. Oh, and the medusa. The medusa is really fun. But that's only because they are the strongest enemies in the game, but even at a high level, they're still pretty easy to handle. I mean, not all the time. One time I was trying to fight a group of skeletons alongside a chimera, alongside a lesser dragon, and I got fucked up by all three of them at once. Like, I swear to god, it was a jumping beyond imaginable proportion. <laughs> It's just unfortunate because I have a lot of fun finding these giant monsters, but I wish there was just a little bit more variety and challenge later on. The Headless Horseman is a really cool boss though, I really do like that one. So yeah, when you get strong in this game, it's almost like a Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom type of combat effect. You start out really, really weak in the beginning, so the game feels really hard and challenging, but then eventually you get your health so high up that nothing can really touch you or damage you. Seriously, I remember when I first picked up Tears of the Kingdom and the Gloom Hand scared the absolute shit out of me. But now I got so so strong that I made them my bitch. 
But like what makes these fights worthwhile is the fact that while some of the fights do happen in set designed areas, most of the time, if not all of the fights, save for the final boss, never happen in a big arena. All of the big boss fights and enemy encounters happen in dungeons and in the open world. So if you're lucky, you could be riding an ox card one second and then the next. Hey, did you hear something? Well, sucks to be you, idiot. Your cart's been destroyed by a giant griffin, and now you have to fight it. So to make exploration fun, you got to do shit like this more often. The fact that this can just happen is what makes me appreciate the exploration more. It makes fast traveling not that much worth it. I mean, unless you're trying to do the quest lines, but the quest lines kind of suck, but I'll talk about that later. Also, I forgot to mention, you could just pick up any NPC you like. Like, you could just straight up fireman carry any NPC you want and just throw them like 50 feet away just for the hell of it. Most of the time, you're not punished for it. Most of the time. Come along. <laughs> Oopsie daisy. Anyways, yeah, this is some of the best gameplay ever in an RPG. It sucks that this franchise isn't as big in the RPG genre sphere because it really does a good job at implementing some new ideas. And that is especially true when it comes to one of Dragon's Dogma's most shining features, the pawn system. Speaking of which, uh, looking around, it strikes me that we pawns are all men. I wonder if this speaks to the Arisen's rift wounds. Oh! Why are you gay? Who says I'm gay? You're fucking gay! These adorable little companions are both incredibly adaptive to your gameplay in terms of playstyle, and they are also dumb as rocks. What did they slip on, a banana? They aren't like character companions with their own stories or anything like Skyrim or Fallout. They're technically hired guns that have no will of their own except to follow the will of the Arisen, which is i.e. you. And with that, you now have an army of these clumsy little shits that are always for some reason talking about the goddamn coronation after some point in the game. Mayhap you'll think this a trifle, but I shall never forget the agony I felt. <laughs> Get it, Marcus, but can you shut the fuck up for one second? Every command you give, every action you take in combat, it will slowly mold their brains from bumbly little babies that keep running into walls and then turn them into unstoppable killing machines that also jump off cliffs. <laughs> It's also the way other players can help out other Arisen as well across other playthroughs. Other players make their pawns and they get to put it into the game's online servers, so anytime you're at one of these big rift stones, you can just open it up and pick a pawn of your choosing. It's a cool party system that gives a great sense of teamwork, but also you can make the most horrific abominations imaginable. And share those horrific abominations with other players. I have a modest talent for spotting materials that can be used to enhance your equipment. In a way, they're honestly a second character that you have to take care of so that they can give you an upper hand in combat. And if you keep them dolled up and powerful, other players will bring them into their playthrough so you can earn more rift crystals for your game. Like, they're honestly a second character that you have to take care of so they can give you an upper hand in combat, as well as other players. I mean, seriously, these pawns are a whole system of their own. They take up, like, I think 20 to 30% of the entire game. There is a big issue with this game, though, when it comes to the pawns, is that we unfortunately got this one edition of this thing called Dragon's Plague, which is basically the pawns version of the clap. Now, I never got the worst of it because I always catch it in time, but this will fuck up your game if you're not careful. And you may be asking, well, how can it fuck up your game? Is it that bad? Well, here with Dragon's Plague, if you're not careful, one of your pawns and probably your main pawn, I don't know, it never happened to me, they will contract this fatal illness and it will basically make them sassy as fuck and not listen to your commands. But it's what happens after a couple of days when you don't catch this disease in time. If you don't catch on to Dragon's Plague in one of your pawns in a couple of days and you sleep at a rest in, a cutscene will happen with that specific pawn turning into a dragon and then killing every NPC in the town that you slept in. And of course, depending on which town you slept in, it'll most likely contain a main game NPC and if it's dead, you'll either have to use 100 wake stones until you revive all of the necessary NPCs or use an eternal wake stone just so you can continue the game. Wake stones being this item that you can revive NPCs with, as well as yourself if you fall in battle. This game was made by Eve people. Hideki, why? Coronation. So yeah, Dragon's Plague. It's lots of fun. It kills everyone, but hey, there's a perfect solution to this problem. If any time you see one of your pawn's eyes pulsating red, or if they start talking back to you, or just not listening to your commands, there's only one thing you need to do. It's foolproof, and it's super simple. Oh, wait, shit. Hold on.
There we go. Just just throw them in the water, just like that. No more dragons plague. Problem solved. All right, let's talk about stats and leveling up. So usually in RPGs, as you fight enemies, you gain experience points of some kind, and then you take those big number points, and then you convert them into smaller numbers, and then boost a certain perk or ability. Well, to keep things original here in Dragon's Dogma 2, that takes a full backseat while you just have fun with the game's combat. The whole point of this RPG is not to focus on building a certain stat or just to focus on magic or anything like that. Depending on which vocation you have and how you level up, your certain stats will cater to that vocation that you have in that moment. And you may ask yourself, well, but then how do I know if my character is leveling up the way if I want to if I have no control? Well, my friend, that's where the game surprises you yet again. Because funny enough, you did choose your character's stats in the very beginning because stats are embedded in the character creator. You probably got so distracted by the fact that you can make some really funky and horrifically funny looking people due to how detailed the character creation is. But what the game doesn't tell you is that how you make your character is how your stats will grow throughout the rest of the game. It all matters. If you're short, you're faster. If you're big and fat, you get knocked down less. Enemies like ogres will attack women more often than men. And if you play as a beastron, you'll have less rights. Time was. You scarce saw any beastrels here in Vernworth, but that's changed in recent years. See, a child born of both races always favors the beastron. Huh? If we keep mixing, someday our kingdom will end up with more beastrons than they've got or in Batal. Bye bye, colonizer. Suck a dick, dumb shit. But a perk to being a beastron is that you can actually get past this gate, which actually leads to the second half of the game. So there's perks to almost every build in this game. This game just has a lot of hidden quirks that unironically refuses to tell you. Like, it's leveling out your stats for you automatically, but unless you watch videos like mine, you're not gonna figure that shit out until later. It's really cool, but it really can get annoying when this game doesn't tell you everything. And just like the game hasn't told you everything, I haven't either, so keep watching. But speaking of this game's quirks, the physical comedy in this game is on another level. I swear, the amount of times I was sent flying by a big enemy just throwing me away or seeing my pawns fall off a cliff, it made the long trek across the map more enjoyable just seeing funny moments like this. This calls for a curative. I think it's important that if games have built-in ragdoll effects that they should make them extremely funny because it just makes your games better by default to have ragdoll effects and it makes them even better if they're funny. I mean, just look at Red Dead 1's ragdoll effects. Nice to see you, mister. Dragon's Dogma 2 may not have the most insane ragdolls, but the way enemies move and attack can be comical on their own. Ogres can do flying drop kicks for God's sakes. Oh, and this shit can happen. Hey, here's another mechanic that Dragon's Dogma 2 doesn't tell you about. There's an affinity mechanic that's built into literally every NPC you come across. Literally every single one. You can give a gift to any NPC and if you do it enough times throughout the week, they will basically fall in love with you by like day 7 or 8. The affinity mechanic is more akin towards the main side characters of the story that you come across because depending on which side character that you have the highest affinity with, it'll actually add some importance to the story later on, but only by like a little bit. But the best part about this secret mechanics that if you romance random NPCs throughout the town and then go back to your own house in that town, two of those NPCs that you romanced in that town will end up at your house together and they'll just beat the shit out of each other. The best part about all this is that you get a fucking achievement for it. Yep, you get an achievement for participating in infidelity. Have faith and you shall prevail. Crazy how this game got review bombed. <laughs> Oh, wait, that's why. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll talk about the microtransactions real quick. Yeah, okay, the microtransactions, they are bad. There's no if, ands, or buts. They shouldn't be there. They're terrible. They're just bad. What the hell is this? Obviously, though, if you pay attention, this has been like this for almost every other Capcom single-player game since, like, Monster Hunter World. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying Capcom's been doing this for a while, even for, like, their highest-rated games. I remember when there was a discussion about this when Resident Evil 4 came out with some microtransactions. It was dumb back then, and it's dumb right now. But here, just for reference, let's check how much it is for every single microtransaction in Monster Hunter World. So let's see, uh, Monster Hunter World. Yeah, okay, I got. Okay, so, uh, see all? I got, oh, I got, uh, oh, $541. What the fuck, Capcom? It's like highway robbery. And dude, I went to go check out Monster Hunter Rise to see if it was bad over there too, and it's even worse. There's more items in, like, the microtransactions area that you can't even buy it at full price. It's all sold separately. Gotta love late-stage capitalism. This is fine. I think what was dumb about all of it is just how Dragon's Dogma got singled out all of the other games. But I understand why, because the stuff that was being sold are literally very common, except for 
for things like the port crystal. Selling this one port crystal on a hyped up game where one of the main parts about it is its limited fast travel just gives it a very bad look. Imagine I never played Dragon's Dogma. I heard it's a good game, so I go to buy it on Steam, but then I see what's being sold on the game's Steam page. I see an item that says port crystal. I see it's for fast travel and assume that because this is sold in a DLC package, I might assume that the fast travel is paywalled. So I would rethink my purchase and just not buy the game because I would be thinking that it's just trying to take my money. It just looked really bad, and the executives that most likely wanted to push for these microtransactions did not care for an angry response whatsoever. They were willing to make whatever type of little dollars they could make off of this game after selling that $70 price tag. Hopefully in due time this practice can end and people can enjoy video games without having to buy like $20 to $30 worth of extra shit that you don't even need. Okay, back to the game because again, the game is still fun. Very good. So after 45 hours of running around like a coked out quail, it's time for the end game. Before you go and fight the big bad dragon though, on your way there you fight some giant that rises from the water and uh, even after fighting it twice, I still don't get the significance. I mean, the most damage it would have done is destroy the slave camp that you escaped from the beginning of the game. It even avoids the evacuation site entirely and I think it stops on its own even if you don't fight it. I don't think you even need to interact with a giant in any way, but it's kind of cool to fight. It's funny because this fight feels more shallow to Colossus than any of the other ones. Okay, but anyways, it's time to face the dragon. And it gives you two choices, and this is where the affinity mechanic comes into play. The dragon at the moment in his hand is holding the NPC who you romance the most in the game, and he gives you the choice to either fight him, save your lover, and become the sovereign of the land. But he also gives you the choice to leave the area, inadvertently sacrificing your loved one. But with that sacrifice, brings an age of world peace. And for me, I worked really hard to make sure it was Eureka, because the game made it seem like she was the big choice considering she's been there since the very beginning. I did everything I could. I did escort missions with her, I did her side quest, and I even got the Riverside romance scene with her. Hell, I even gave her the freaking wedding ring. But guess what? None of that mattered because the dragon thought the one I was in love with was fucking Lamont. All because I gave him newt liquor and escorted him to the bar in Vermont. I just wanted the warfare vocation, not to be drunk in love with a former Arisen. The end credits still had Eureka by the cliffside, but still, it made me mad that the dragon got that completely wrong. This got me questioning if the romance mechanic even worked to begin with. So, I tested this out by going into New Game Plus, and I did the game all over again. I think I lost count of how many flowers I gave Eureka because I wanted a dragon to know who I was in love with. And I swear to God, the game doubled down. Down. Not only did the dragon choose the wrong person again, but so did the end credits. The dragon this time picked the fucking elf sister to the one archer guy that I met at the beginning of the game. All cause I wanted to do her quest line because I missed it in my first playthrough. I didn't even talk to her after I did her quest line. The game just locked me into her romance at that point. And trust me, that's not the worst of it. I was hoping the game would at least put Eureka at the cliffside again, but no. Instead of Eureka, it was Sven! Sven! I escorted his ass one time in the unmourned world. One time! That was more than enough for the game to go, oh yeah, no, Sven and the Arisen, they definitely are in love. Look at those cuties. Look at them. Oh, that's adorable. This game could be so fucking stupid. Anyways, you hit the dragon, save your lover, fight him in the middle of an active volcano, beat the dragon, take back your heart, and now Vernworth is saved. All hail the Sovereign, and guess what? The Sovereign was you the whole time. Yeah, that intro cutscene was basically your POV, but you didn't know it at that point. Anyways, yeah, you beat the game. You are now King Baldwin. I keep on chasing the hat. Why is he even assuming you're missing? You have fulfilled your charge and you're not satisfied. Nope. Witness with your own eyes, or through the eyes of another, the fate of this world. Nerd. Surprise, fucker, that's not actually the ending. Remember the sword that you got from that magic gooner that opened that one door? Yeah, you're supposed to stab yourself with it. You stab yourself, drown the dragon in the brine, and uh, oh, shit. The time has come. Let us go home, together. To a world under your rightful rule. Oh, well everything's fucked now. Oh, hey! 
there's the two. Yeah, this is a uh, this is the true end game right here. The world opens up while closing off other parts due to the red fog that's consuming the world, and God, this looks incredible. The atmosphere, the rising stakes, and new content all got me really excited. So with the area all updated and dark and new stuff to find, what's the first thing that I had to do? Do annoying chores and fight the exact same enemies that I have been for the last 50 hours. Fuck you. Have fun. It did open up a lot, so like fairy stones were more abundant and there were more major port crystals on the map. So traveling was easier, like yeah cool I guess that helps, but as I was going around I was getting a couple side quest requests and when looking up how to complete them I realized I started them way too late. I said earlier that I did a new game plus run and with that run I did the side quest that I missed out on. Because in the end game you have this quest to evacuate the towns and I forgot to do the Arborhar quest line so I couldn't evacuate the elf village. Adding that with my bad timing I accidentally let the evacuation site get enveloped by the fog. When I made it to the end game area my first playthrough it just felt like a race against the clock since I didn't know what to do at the time. It just wasn't a lot of fun. It was fun when I was you know finishing up all the quest lines but only by like a little bit. Again it just felt like I was completing a checklist. Either way the side quests in this game are hard to follow and it feels impossible to do most of them. Unless you know exactly what you're doing you're going to get lost. I know I played games like Dark Souls before. I know when I need to look stuff up but in those games at least I can teleport and most quests you can avoid failing unless you kill a specific boss. Dragon's Dogma is basically like, oh, oops, looks like you wasted too much time. Now this character is dead and you failed the quest line. Suck a dick, dumb shit. I mean, it's not that bad, I guess. It's a consequence for you taking your time, but like, why do they all have to just die? But again, it's not like the rewards for these quest lines are anything special. If you miss them, so what? You're not really missing out on anything too much. I mean, Wilhelmina's quest line is really good, but that's the only side quest I think that is actually like A tier level of like quality. But sorry about that, I'm rambling too much. I need to finish this off. So yeah, uh, the end game. It's whatever. It has some cool items and new bosses, but it's just the same map with no brine and with more of the same enemies placed. The final dragon boss fight and the bosses you fight near the pillars of light in the unmourned world are technically the only fights that have arenas to fight in. And like whole ass like cutscene presentations. I don't dislike them, but they feel kind of gimmicky at best. But at least they are new enemy types, even though they aren't the best type of enemy types. After evacuating Batal in Vermont, I went to finish the game. And the ending when it comes to like, you know, riding the giant dragon and talking about cycles and all of that, uh, I still am kind of confused about the ending. I mean, I kind of understand the ending, you know, it's talking about like how this world will basically never end and there's basically going to be another Arisen that will just take your place. It's, it's kind of whatever. I've heard it all before. I don't know. Again, I think Dark Souls did it better. It's a cool message, but you know, it's whatever. The end song for the credits is really cool though. Made my choice. I finally see. Okay, I'm done. Uh, seven and a half out of ten. This game fucking rocks. Ah, it must. Are you the? Ah, are you? 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 Ah, this game is something. I don't know if it's something special, but it's something. It's got its rough edges, but its rough edges aren't enough to deter me away from what is still an incredible game. It's funny because for my new game plus run, I actually modded in more fast travel points and port crystals for myself because I wanted to actually do the major side quest that I either messed up on or missed and I wanted to find all of the secrets. Plus I wanted to help more people in the unmourned world. It was a mixed bag because again, I am glad I was able to move around quicker and finish the quest, but the journey wasn't that fun in my new game plus run. It was mainly because I kept teleporting around. I don't regret it because I got to experience the quest lines like Wilhelmina's and Hugo's, but because I didn't get to experience the funny moments of wandering around the world and seeing what I would get in between, it made the journey a lot more hollow. Don't you think I will as long as you know what you're doing and you know where you're going, the quests are easy to complete. The map isn't that big. The game may not be amazing when it comes to loot or quest design, but entering the game and going for the long walks around the map with your pawns can give you some incredible experience. It's as they say, it's about the journey, not the destination. Oh, come on, man. Okay, I'll leave now. In the end, I highly recommend playing Dragon's Dogma 2. I'd say wait for the game to go on sale before getting it, but when it does, fucking buy it. This video took me a minute to finish, and I'm glad I did, because I had a lot of thoughts on this game, and while it's not perfect, I do think it's an incredible game. And with that, I shall take my leave. I'm gonna go play the first game now and see what I've been missing out on. You all have a very wonderful day, my sovereign arisens. Or, you know, bye-bye. Uh, uh, <laughs>